Hello, good afternoon and welcome. Thanks for uh, thanks for checking in on your Sunday with you. I know there's a lot of other things to do out there and whatnot. Now that the pandemic's open, you can go outside and freely and dance and whatnot. So thanks for uh, pulling up a chair and listening to today's talk. Um, just looking at a few names here, I noticed a couple of people I know, which is, which is good to see. And uh, um, I, my friend, uh, where is he here? Is, is, let's see, Kevin Bauer is here from the Friends of the Vancouver Archives, a fellow board member and whatnot. Um, uh, Kelly made a great uh, 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 plea to become a member. I, I presume all the people here today are members, unless you snuck in and like, like, that's like sneaking in free to a concert or something like that. Uh, I trust you're all members. If you're not, hey, join the join the friends. And if you if you are become both a BC friends of the BC archives and friends of the Vancouver archives, if you find me and you tell me that, I will buy you a drink. I, I will buy you a pint uh, somewhere, and I'm easily found in some watering holes uh, across British Columbia when I'm out and about. So if you uh, if you happen to stop me, I'll, I'll, I'll and you're you're a member of both organizations, I'll uh, I'll happily buy you buy you a drink, and we'll we'll sit and talk for hours about some fine points of uh, uh, BC or Vancouver history. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about, as I say, my new book. I'm going to talk a little bit how the book came together uh, with a group like this. I know I can get into some information about uh, some of where the the photos and the information of the book. And some of the archival material came together, which is often sometimes the biggest part of, uh, of writing a book like this or writing a, a local history uh, book. You might, you might have some questions as we go. I gather you can enter those into the comments section and uh, my friend Jesse there is going to uh, sort of curate those and at the end. I may answer your question as we go. So you may want to make a note, and maybe save them to the end or, or whatnot. But uh, if I haven't, if I miss something, I'm, I'm happy to stick around a little extra time and, and answer questions if need be. Um, I'm gonna, I've got about 40 photos I'm going to race through in a quick measure here and uh, not race unduly, but but uh, but we're going to go with lots of ground to cover here in terms of the book, not only talking about um, the story itself, but some of the, um, as I say, some of the, how some of the research came together, which is uh, an interesting background and some things maybe I couldn't put in the book uh, for some legal reasons, which are which are interesting as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to share the screen here if I can so we can get things beginning. And let me see if I have that. I trust you can all see that fairly well. Not sure if that takes up your whole screens or not. I think you have the option of doing that at home if the image is too small for you, but let me know if, I've, if everything's good there. Cover of the book, Vancouver Vice, it just came out um, two months ago. It's been on the BC bestseller list since December. So I'm certainly uh, very pleased about that. By way of a little, uh, a little bit of background. Ah, right, here we go. We'll start to, um, you know, so much of the but number of the books I've done have all sort of focused on um, how Vancouver has done a very good job of bringing in the new, but maybe not the best job of keeping the old um, for a variety of reasons. And a number of my books, you know, in terms of the history of the province, the history of Vancouver, I've tended to sort of more look at the more recent history of the city. The first book I did in 2012 was about the history of the Penthouse nightclub on Seymour Street there, Liquor, Lust and the Law. Um, uh, I, dare I say, I've been told one of the most popular books of, of Vancouver history that's, that's come out in, in, uh, in, over the history of the subject, really. It, it's gone into multiple printings. I, I didn't think a little book about the, uh, the odd goings on of a, of a strip bar on Seymour Street would garner such attention or, or or praise, but I, it uh, it certainly opened up the doors for me in terms of some of the writing that I had been doing prior to that, um, which had just been article writing about the, about the history of the city. I did a book about the history of the Commodore Ballroom, came out in 2015. Um, it was a, a real labor of love. I had, I had played at the Commodore Musician maybe 25 times over the course of a few different bands. Uh, none of them got gold records, but they were they were gold nights out to be sure. Um, and that was a fun project too. And that began interestingly enough when the Commodore itself asked me to put together an archive of all the shows that had happened. Everybody knew that, oh yeah, the Clash played there. Was it 79, 80? I can't remember. You know, they didn't really have all the dates archived properly. So I went through um, every issue of the Georgia Strait every week, every year, going back to 1973 to record the exact dates of shows or find out when they moved and moved that around on a huge spreadsheet. It was like building the Great Wall of China out of pieces of Lego. And it took a couple of years, but it, uh, it helped kind of me sort of understand the nature of shows, the nature of entertainment, the kinds of music that had happened in Vancouver and popularized and then maybe gone away uh, over the years because the Commodore seen it all. Um, as by almost a little bit of a follow-up, <clears throat> excuse me to that, was a book called Vancouver After Dark, which was my previous book. And uh, which went, went delved into nightclubs that weren't around anymore 
penthouse and the night and the Commodore, of course, are still around, but there's so many places in Vancouver and so many in, in, like in Victoria as well, um, that were sort of favored old places that are gone now. I remember Harpo's, for instance, in, in Victoria. Another generation might remember the Sirocco Club in, in uh, Victoria. Um, the Last Gang in Town was a book about East Vancouver street gangs, uh, a little bit more maybe of a police story than necessarily an entertainment story, uh, of course. And the story of the Clark Park gang, kind of a mythical story that I had grown up with in Vancouver. Um, and uh, but takes place in the or very early 1970s. And it was interesting to, um, I, I, I didn't necessarily know I was doing it at the time, but there was, a, there was an analysis of looking at the, how the city had changed through the lens of its crime history a little bit with that book. Because uh, while it's called the last gang in town, the Clark Parkers were not, of course, the last gang in town. There are other gangs um, on today, of course, but they were the last of their kind. So it, uh, the book did very well and, and has been optioned for a, a TV or a film series, which hasn't happened yet, but I'm hoping it will. Uh, but it's been interesting to watch uh, uh, people's reaction to it because it's, it was, this was definitely a book for people who were born and raised here and grew up with that and, and convinced me there was an uh, further that there was an audience for that. So I think I'm going to jump, just jump back to the, the idea of, of doing Vancouver Vice. In many ways came from the last gang in town. One of the police officers that are in, that's in um, last gang in town, uh, Detective Al Robson, uh, who uh, plays a small part in that book, gets almost full character measure in this one. Uh, I found him such an interesting character. And he told me in 2017 of a story that him and his partner, Gord Bader, um, uh, looked at in the West End. And he told me the story in about maybe three or four minutes tops. And a shiver went up my spine when he told it to me. And I thought to myself, that's the next thing I'm going to write a book about. I know it. And sometimes you get hit with a lightning bolt like that and when you hear a story and you think, I've got to find out more about this. And so that was sort of the genus of the book, a little bit coming out of, uh, of, of Last Gang in Town, which is a, a book a couple years old now. But I wanted to sort of revisit that, that theme again. And, um, and it's interesting. So I, moving from the East Vancouver to the West End, it's interesting to look at the, how the West End was viewed in, um, in the 1960s. And, and there, was a real, um, there was a real boon of development that happened in the 1960s. Um, there was a great film called West End 66 that was done by the CBC. You can look at it on YouTube. Um, the whole thing is there and it's got a lively jazzy, you know, score to it. And you, you see these vintage shots of uh, the West End of the 60s, which are really fascinating because you it's it it would be looked at maybe. I don't know if Yale Town now here in Vancouver is, is appropriate, but it was looked at as sort of real cause upon this is a modern neighborhood. Now, this is what this is where it's all happening. And um, there, as I say, there's some great vintage shots, but the promise that, that was offered in, in, uh, in you know, the West End in those years, within 10 years was, interestingly enough, a much different place. Um, there was a lot of development that was going on in uh, the West End in those years. Um, like this George Dyack uh, uh, photo from the Vancouver Sun shows, a lot of the old, you know, single room, or, or you know, uh, a lot of the housing uh, that was down there, the small houses or, or, or three-story, you know, um, walk-ups, you know, and things like that that were, uh, that were around or rooming houses that were around since the 1920s were starting to go away um, in the in the 1960s and towers were being built. Um, this is 1700 block of Davy. Um, everybody knows that building down the corner. I've, gosh, the name of it escapes me. You'll forgive me, um, but it's just being redone now with a bunch of Musqueam Nation art that's down front. Of but so this 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 1700 block of Davy. You would know it today as you walk down it. But all, of course, all those houses are gone. Um, this is July 1958 when this was taken. You know, the West End building boom in the 1960s really changed the West End forever. Um, and it's interesting to note that between 1959 and 1972, developers built more than 220 high-rise apartments in, in, uh, in the area. And uh, they were everything from smaller apartment buildings, three or four or five, six-story buildings, to some of the towers you see now. There was a huge building that was some of it was happening in Marpole and Caresdale as well, which is interesting. But the real development that was happening in the city was 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 happening in the West End. And it's remarkable to think how much that changed. And it's funny to look at some of the talk um, at the time when people are talking about the, the, the houses that are being replaced with towers. You know, nowadays, or they, you know, they talk about then how, you know, how crazy it is to live next door to somebody you don't know, or there's no yard, there's no place to park your car, maybe. There's not a parking down there. There's no yard for the kids to put, you know, like uh, in the same tone that we talk about, you know, some of the condo buildings in the city today that are built with, oh, they're just towers of glass and steel and whatnot. Well, we were, 
now we look back at these old apartment buildings as sort of these gems and oh, what, how wonderful they, they, they are. But at the time, they were given the same criticism and static in, in many times in terms of conversation that were, that were around when they were built. Um, crime, of course, was happening in, in the West End, which what the place was not without uh, it, it's, its crime. It's interesting that um, there was a series in the late 50s of what were sort of referred to as the bachelor murders. Um, they didn't necessarily say it outright, but a lot of um, uh, gay men who lived on their own were the targets of crime for one reason or another. In many ways, in, uh, very often there was a situation where maybe they invited somebody they had met home and then, uh, you know, made a pass or something like that that was met with violence. Uh, the guy just thought he was being nice to inviting him over for a drink, but when the tables turned, and and that was a, that that gay panic defense was was used in criminal courts by uh, those being prosecuted for many times. Well, he came on to me aggressively and things like that. Other times they were just simply uh, easy targets for you know crime because, and whatnot. So there was a series of these, and the book details this. I think it's the first time it's ever been really looked at seriously. And there were about there were several instances in the in the in that period, and uh, some of them. Some of the crimes remain unsolved today. Other ones where someone was caught, the person was uh, let go um, because of that, uh, this defense, this attitude that, oh, well, he came on to me aggressively, so I had to fight back. Um, that, that gay panic defense went all the way up into the 1980s and, and whatnot. It's quite astonishing. Um, it wasn't just gay men that were targets. Of course, there were women who were afraid uh, increasingly in the 1960s um, that the neighborhood was beginning to change. Uh, and whatnot. It was, it's interesting to look back at how the how the attitudes towards the West End. Now, of course, the West End was still, a, you know, by and large, a safe place to live. It had the same amount of, uh, you know, sort of property crime or vandalism or or things like that. But the nature of the, the sheer rise in population over a short number of years seemed to test the sort of the the you know the the barriers of of what was uh, what was happening. And there there was an area that was sort of under policed. Uh, at the time as well. There was a sort of astonishing, you know, certainly about 10 officers sort of dedicated to the whole West End for many, many years until they, until they raised that. Um, moving along here. Oh, okay. uh, there we go. Um, prostitution in the West End had always, you know, we, we have this attitude or maybe a thought that it was really something that was only happening um, in the, um, in the 1970s. Well, it goes back to, this is a case in 1961. Fascinating case where, um, a woman, a madam who was running uh, this organization, I get a lot of details in the book, I'll just condense it here, um, had a special code that she would use to uh, uh, send, you know, the, the dozen or so women that she had in her stable of, of working girls out to various hotels uh, and whatnot. And uh, it was quite, an, uh, quite a, something, it's interesting that Bank of Her Son actually published the phone numbers um, there was a hotline that they had where they had sort of two receptionists. They were getting so many calls at, the, at this apartment that they had in the West End, which was also sort of lushly laid out. It was like a three bedroom apartment so they could have clientele in there, but they would also be sending the girls out to, out to hotels, a real sort of a real network. And this is one of the first cases where um, a, a, a conspiracy case was made in Canada against a prostitution ring. Um, and as I say, the Vancouver Sun published the phone numbers, but they got one of the numbers wrong. Uh, which resulted in a lot of people who read the article phoning that number. And you can imagine if you were the homeowner and you were getting calls from sort of heavy breathers or, or people, yeah, I'd like to get a girl for that. Who? I'm, you know, I'm, you know, so, some guy sitting down to his TV dinner. I always hoped it would be some priest who would be instead of answering these calls. It would just, you know, it would, it would just be red faced having to pick up the phone all the time or, or finally having to change his number. But the, the, the son apologized later for uh, publishing the wrong number. And, but I always felt sorry for whoever that person uh, whoever that person was. Alex de Cimbriani is an interesting figure, a little bit later in, in, uh, in the in 1970s in uh, West End history. The guy who proclaimed himself the proud mayor of a city within a city. He had political aspirations. He, uh, he put on a, a huge sort of farewell party at the Western Bayshore for the outgoing police chief in 1972. Um, he was a, a, a property owner, of, ostensibly, who... Um, it had a real sort of rise of success um, and even had to, his own crest, the Irkendale, uh, which you can see in the corner there. Um, it ends up, and he, he, as I say, he had, he had big political aspirations um, until um, uh, Alan Fotheringham had published an article saying that Alex de Cimbriani was not his name and some of the story, backstory he'd invented about it himself wasn't true at all. And in fact, he was sort of fleecing 
uh, some of the older uh, residents that he had in some of his apartment buildings. And it was a real sort of Icarin fail, if you know, a real uh, a drop. And later on is accused of uh, uh, molestation uh, with, some, with some young boys. Um, so, but again, some of the characters, you know, Vancouver was so much in the 1970s, there were so many different characters. Maybe we, things are less, uh, less anonymous now, or, or we, we lead less public lives or something in many ways, or we, they've all switched online. They're not so much out anymore, but, you know, in the 1970s, you had so many, you had Murray Pezum, you had, you know, so many of the, the political figures and whatnot that were popular, the Harry Rankin, of course, and whatnot, but, and to Cimbriani, some of these characters that, I don't know if we'd have so many of those anymore, but they were certainly, maybe we do, but they weren't as colorful as they were back then. Uh, here we meet, uh, uh, but it was a great uh, year for uh, mustaches of the Vancouver Police Department, as you can tell there, um, and whatnot. If you look over to your far left, you'll see a guy in a gray sweater there. That's Al Robson. And right below him in the leather jacket is Gord Bader. Um, these two gentlemen um, joined the Vancouver Police Department in 1950, or probably 1971, uh, 50 years ago, I was going to say, and uh, 50 years ago last year. And uh, uh, it's interesting to note, I get into some of their backstory and how they came together to basically be become sort of partners on, on the police force. They, they were for maybe about three years, three, four years, and they moved on to other departments. But a lot of what the story, there's a certain crime story that is focused on in uh, Vancouver Vice is about their story and whatnot. So I wanted to introduce you to them there. One of the first things they had to do was look at the, uh, what the, the um, uh, English Bay bathhouse which in the 1970s had become to be used as a cruising spot for uh, gay men uh, and whatnot. And neighbors had started to complain. They were out for a walk at night uh, and they'd seen some people having sex in the bathroom or they were propositioned when they went in there or uh, and whatnot. So the police department went down to observe and sort of uh, set up some stings, you know, and, and Robson and Bader really sort of thought they the, their police career had was going nowhere, basically doing you know, watching toilets for, for, for uh, their, their, their duty, uh, you know, responsibilities. And it's, uh, it wasn't something they necessarily enjoyed uh, doing. What's interesting through this, though, is a number of people were, uh, were arrested for gross indecency at this time. And a number of them were married men that when they were taken down to uh, the police station and then their wives had to come down and bail them out, the secrets of their other life were revealed. And uh, it, they, police began to, learn from uh you know prosecutions that weren't, weren't going anywhere because a lot of these people were, were committing suicide uh in, in the wake of getting caught their 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 lives exposed this way so the vancouver police department did it very quietly and i and this is i give this to their to their credit they stopped this program they just thought look this is not the intended consequence i mean we wanted to stop the party that was getting out of hand down there but we we don't need this so somebody i don't know who um terminated this program and just said, look, put some more lights up down there. So it's not so, you know, not so a uh, discreet place to go. And that solved it. Um, but it was a, arguably a very low point in the history of the relationship between the Vancouver's gay community and the Vancouver police department, where the gay community felt they were being targeted. Now, at the time, there were a number of vice squad officers who, excuse me, um, said that, you know, there's no, um, there's no bias that we have. We don't care or anything like that. That may have been true from the higher ups and, and from some of the guys that were working in the trenches, but there were obviously some police officers who expressed their own um, animus and bias towards some member of the gay, some members of the gay community that were, they were picking them up. And this magazine, Gay Tide from September 1978, it's a, sort of a startling, you know, the cover of the magazine is a startling uh, example of that. Um, there was just a real feeling at the time that the police were, uh, uh, we're out to target uh, gay people. There's quite, this is a different Davy Street and a different West End. This isn't the Rainbow Crosswalk of, era of the of the West End. Of course, this is a different this is a different time. Um, but it's interesting to look at uh, the attitudes that were that were around at that time, both from police um, and um, and from uh, a lot of retired uh, VPD members I talked to and the members of the gay community themselves. There was a different West End, the, the infamous Taurus Bathhouse. There was a 1233 Hornby Street that was there for years, part of an old hotel that had been there since the First World War. My friend Andre Tardif uh, was good enough uh, to keep his membership card from 1975. And this one, and there's some really sort of a funny stories, but also quite alarming how open um, 
the sex was at some of these, uh, you know, some of these places at the Tardif, or pardon me, the, the Taurus was a real notorious spot for that. It burned down in, uh, on Valentine's, the evening of Valentine's Day uh, in 1992, one last uh, fiery evening for the, for the place in more ways than one. But it's interesting to look at that and, uh, and also to look at what I get into a lot of the book is some of the real, the emergence of the gay history of, of, of the West End, which seemingly has always been there. Um, we don't know necessarily when the first gay residents decided this was a great neighborhood for us. It was, it was probably in the 1920s, by all accounts, when I spoke to a lot of Vancouverites um, of a certain vintage that were around the 1950s. They knew it as the gay end of town as well. It was, that was a common knowledge, even though it didn't start to publicly become so until the 1970s. Um, one interesting thing is this gentleman, Ron Dutton, um, who uh, basically collected a, a gay archive of, of Vancouver, um, but run his own in his own closet, as you can see uh, here, and ended up donating all this material to the city of Vancouver archives, um, which has now been scanned. And, and if, it's actually amazing. The, the archives are a little top heavy with, with so much of this stuff now that we need more to, to you know, to, to, to bat with the other groups that were around at the time too, to bounce out. But there's an amazing archive of, of flyers and posters and newspaper articles that Ron collected over those years. And uh, now they're safely, you know, originals, but also scannable versions of it. Thanks to the friends of the Vancouver archives, I might add, uh, that, uh, that were involved in, in making that stuff uh, public, more public. And it's amazing to look through some of the, uh, the images, and posters and flyers and, and the newspaper articles that Ron had saved, which I'll get to a little bit in, about a key person were, were of great help to me. Um, the book gets into a lot of some of the old uh, gay night spots in town, which were just beginning to emerge. Um, this was a place called Faces. It was just at the corner of Seymour and Robson Street. You can see it right off in the distance where that woman is walking to a you frame it location, a frame it store that was there. We're going to get to that a little bit later, but because that has an interesting significance. But um, uh, Faces was a very well known, uh, very well remembered sort of unlicensed club, essentially. You know, you, it was a you sort of snuck your own drinks in and whatnot. But some of the first disco music you could hear in the city happened there. And it was this was sort of a precursor to Love Affair, another famous Seymour Street nightclub. Um, that, uh, that folks might remember up by the 1200 block of Seymour. But this was down by 795 nightclub, uh, pardon me. And I guess the, I'm trying to think of where there's a tel Telus building there now. I can't remember now. Anyway, so many things changed on that block. And that that block itself where the U Frame It uh, store is, was, and you can see the old Capital Six Theater behind it, that was that big brick building behind it. Um, that, that block has now been uh, almost uh, from the alleyway to Seymour Street completely changed now. The Playpen Central, a great, uh, or Playpen South, pardon me. This was uh, a, a, a really wild uh, uh, club at the time. This is a photo that uh, my friend uh, Orif uh, took at the time. And it was, it, you know, you could see what, uh, uh, just how wild it could be on any given night, probably in there. Great parties. And there's a, a, anybody who was any of the, if you managed to speak to any of the, uh, any gay residents of Vancouver who lived in Vancouver in those years, this was the 1970s up until the very early 80s. I think the, uh, the Playpen South was there. Um, we'll remember uh, that place. Interesting, one night, uh, Al Robson, Detective Al Robson from the Vancouver Police Department, who, who was in uniform one night, had to go down. They were looking for, they had a warrant. They were looking for somebody. They thought they'd heard word that he might, might, might be in there. And the night that he arrived, there was a police themed night there with everybody in sort of police uniforms. And when he walked in, all the patrons there just thought, wow, like that's a really legitimate looking, that's a, that's a very realistic Vancouver Police Department uniform he got. And he sort of walked up to the bar and got, spoke to the bartender asking, hey, have you seen this guy around it? And after he, he sort of got a pinch on the bum one too many times, he thought, well, I, I, this is the wrong night for me to be here. I'm not going to get any answers here. And he walked out again. But I thought that was an amusing story of, uh, of uh, police uh, at work. Different morals back then than, than we have now, of course, and that's part of what the book gets into. Um, the Vice Squad had these morality raids, even on bookstores and, and looking for um, some of the pornography that was uh, done. Now, that's not something that, I don't know if the, the, you know, there's one of the points I get into the book, there's actually no Vancouver Vice Squad today, the, the calendar exploitation unit. But now, I don't know if there has been a pornography uh, investigation in Vancouver for 30 years. I, I, 20 years at least, you know, like it's not something that the, the, the police get tasked about. Of course, so much of this stuff has moved online and it's probably a lot more salacious and a little bit more vivid than some of the magazines, uh, you know, that you'll see, that you see here. 
um, if you zoom in on some of those, I, I, some of the titles there, they're actually very, they're really vivid. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's, it, 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 they, there were these raids that they did at the time, and even on bookstores uh, that happened at the Bill Duthie bookstore, Bill Duthie himself had to defend some of his titles. Um, and this was like books like Last Eggs at the Brooklyn. This was not, this was not, uh, you know, open pornography or anything like that. And it went, you know, took these cases to the Supreme Court of Canada and lost, you know, in, in, uh, in, and this is the 1970s again. This isn't 1950s or 1940s Vancouver. This is more, more recent Vancouver. There was a whole different sense of morality back then. Some people might remember this truck. Ernie Ruff drove this truck. I certainly remember this kid driving around and sort of barely making right hand and left hand turns in, in busy intersections without clipping another car. But this was a gentleman who um, had lived a, apparently a life of sin. And then fascinatingly, one night at the Penthouse nightclub where he was going to decide to drink and, and maybe get a, uh, see if he could look at a girl for the evening for himself. He was visited apparently by God himself. And a vision told him, look, you've got to build this truck and you're going to, you've got to put some uh, Bible passages and uh, whatnot. There's no word whether God actually paid cover that night at the penthouse. Uh, but he apparently visited Ernie Ruff and told him that he must do this. And I remember this car, Vancouverites might, and there's some people on the island because he lived on Vancouver Island, if I remember correctly. Um, so he would drive this car up and down the Trans-Canada Highway from, uh, from the island down to Vancouver. And, and this was a, this was a constant, uh, this was a constant scene, especially in the summers, uh, and a lot down by. It used to it used to park quite a bit down by the uh, Western Bayshore building down there, uh, on the on the causeway to, to Stanley Park. But you wouldn't see this today necessarily. You'll see some religious strike. But again, Vancouver seemed to be a different moral place back then. We had Bernice Girard, who was a Pentecostal minister, who found herself she was uh, on on uh, Vancouver City Council and and reelected. And as much as she's looked at as sort of a, like the, the Saturday Night Live church lady and sort of a figure of humor and derision now, you know, she had a lot of supporters then for, uh, you know, shutting down Caligula being shown in a movie theater on Granville Street or banning nude uh, sunbathing at Wreck Beach. These were, you know, again, there were a lot of people sort of rolled her eyes at her back then, but she had a huge number of supporters, especially from older Vancouverites. So the vice squad begins to sort of take a lot more prominence in uh, the city in, in the beginning of these years, um, or pardon me, in the in the mid seventies. Not only just in the West End, but downtown, because uh, downtown uh, around Georgia Street was a, was a, a high track area for uh, some of the more uh, expensive uh, street uh, 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 sex workers that were out there at the time. Um, this gentleman uh, looks like he's up in the uh, Hotel Vancouver. There, I've actually I've, I've walked by there the other day trying to replace that suite where he was to see uh, to see where he was looking down but uh, this is a great photo from the Vancouver Sun archives um, which have all been the photos of, from the Sun of the province I think there are 1.8 maybe 2 million photographs uh, in the old uh, archives of the Sun but all been have been now given to uh, the city of Vancouver archives so one thing that the friends of the Vancouver archives is trying to do is do some fundraising to scan these right now with the scanners and the manpower available I think it's going to take about 70 years to scan that many images. Um, if we can hopefully maybe just be able to hire a couple more scanners, so it might take 30 years, I'd be happy. But it'd be great if uh, we, if we can maybe get a couple more to do that. So it might only take 15 years to get it all. So we, you know, especially what's key is a lot of the people who are be pictured in these photographs are known to Vancouverites now. 70 years from now, not so much. We might not know as much information about them, you know, that uh, and the significance of some of these pictures uh, and who they are. So it's uh, it's something we're trying to do with the with the friends of the Vancouver Archives. So if you want to join our efforts, we'd we'd love to have your help or or your your advice on it. Also, um, this is a gentleman by the name of Wayne Harris, and Wayne Harris originally moved from Halifax and came to Vancouver. He had uh, worked as a um, as a sex worker as a in his teenage years. He bounced around. He didn't have the easiest life by any stretch of the imagination, but he came to Vancouver and ostensibly wanted to find, uh, sort of find, found his own operation working as a pimp. It's remarkable to me when I started interviewing older members of Vancouver's gay community, how well he was known, uh, how well he was disliked by many uh, or avoided. Other people liked him, said, ah, he was nice to me. I, you know, my mother liked him too, even, but other people said, I, I wanted to steer clear from him. He was bad news right from the get-go. I knew that he was hanging around with some real tough um, street hustlers, and I didn't like him. I didn't, uh, and there's some stories of that, um, particularly of him coming into faces one night and pulling a knife uh, on somebody. 
Um, and this was one of the figures that I had heard about from Al Robson when he first told me that story some time ago um, in 2017 about this network uh, that he had looked at. The female prostitutes that were, and sex workers, pardon me, that were working in the West End in those years, um, are, that story is very well known. And the story of female sex workers is probably better known than the male side of sex workers that were around in these years and in today. I mean, arguably that with the with the uh, with the Picton investigation, of course, the missing women, the, the story of, of, of female sex work is, is far more well known to our uh, to our eyes and ears and, and, uh, and perhaps experience um, uh, with some friends or relatives that, that may have found themselves in, in uh, doing this, but less so with, um, with the male sex workers who were um, very often um, underaged um, and whatnot. And uh, the rise of, um, of, of that is a problem that's less remembered in these years. Um, this is an article by Marcus G, who's now a columnist with the Globe and Mail, at this year in 1977, when this came out, he was a young reporter just in journalism school. And in between summers, the province and the Sun would hire, uh, you know, young journalism students to work. And, and he went out on a, uh, a ride along with Al Robson and Gord Bader. And when the news of this uh, hit the streets that Robson and Bader had said, there's probably about 200 young male sex workers, underage sex workers working Vancouver streets. This hit the newspaper hit papers Monday morning, and and uh, the mayor had to answer to this. The police chief and, and uh, in um, it, it was a huge sort of it was a big issue at the time. It went away quickly because people said oh, this got to be it's got to be conjecture. Um, uh, it's interesting that that uh, Robson and Bader got called to the carpet Monday morning, and, and they were asked in and said, "Who the hell told you to tell?" Uh, this reporter that there's two hundred. He said, "Well, that's what we think. That's what we're seeing on the street." Um, and they were, they were criticized and, and Bader actually sort of fought back and said, you know, how come is it when we tell the truth about something, you guys are scrambling around with your chickens, like chickens with their head cut off. He said, Robson told me when he said this, he slunk into his chair. He didn't want to, he didn't want to be, he thought he was get, they were going to get fired for, for sort of talking back to their supervisors, to the chief and some of the inspectors that were in So they said, all right, if you think there's that many out there, then you investigate it. You go out there and find and count the numbers. And they were, that's what they were sort of tasked to do in the summer of 77. Um, they only were on that detail for about six weeks when a new sort of sex worker task force was appointed and uh, Robson was promoted um, and found himself working in a different end of town. A conspiracy theorist might say these guys were sort of cut off before they did any further investigation on it. Um, but truth be told, Robson had been sort of due for a, uh, a promotion and, and, and uh, Bader was promoted not long behind him, but it was just a shift. And uh, one could say, though, that the, that the police, but because the police department didn't put specific priority on this, uh, that may be a legitimate criticism. Um, but Harris, uh, as a result of uh, Robson and uh, Bader's investigation, is charged and convicted, and he goes to jail for two years. Um, when he gets out, he uh, finds himself uh, on the payroll of a man by the name of Hal Keller. And Keller is the CEO of the You Frame It uh, stores. You might, if you're not familiar with them, or maybe you're newer, uh, newer to British Columbia, they were a chain of stores. They were actually across Canada and the US. Um, I think he had, Keller at one point had about 20 of these places across North America and whatnot. He became quite wealthy from this. And Keller was previously a client of Harris. Um, and when Harris got out of jail, interestingly enough, Keller hired him as a quote unquote body guard, putting him on the payroll for about three or $4,000 a month, which is a chunk of change in 1977. It's interesting that um, uh, the police began a wiretap um, between Harris and Keller and started looking into this even further when, when Harris got out and basically returned back to his old habits. This is an interesting photo from a former vice squad uh, detective uh, he took this from his police car um, of his partner. Uh, I won't identify them, uh, but, and you might not be able to tell that the, um, the sex workers uh, t-shirt there says van pigs suck. Um, but it's a very vivid uh, picture of the time uh, in the West End where you kind of, you certainly get a, an idea that the police and, and, and sex workers are sort of at odds with one another and as is the neighborhood. 
Because in 19, 1981, in November 1981, there, these barricades are erected. Um, it's interesting. This is a real sort of turning point in the story uh, of, of West End crime in the city. It had been believed that there were some, some of these cars that were cruising around uh, were part of the problem. In many ways, they said, look, the sex workers are kind of just standing there. They're, not, they're fine. It's the amount of traffic and the people coming down. Some of them aren't even clients, you know, necessarily. They're just looking to talk to a woman very briefly who might get in the car and then drive off. A lot of people were coming down and hooting and hollering and, and, and there would be these, uh, it was a real party, like it was a noisy atmosphere down there. So if you're a resident, depending on where you lived, if you were a couple blocks away from one of the major street corners where um, some of the soliciting was going on, you might not notice it. You might be fine. You might see some of the work, you know, some of the sex workers on your way to school if you're a kid uh, because they were working in the day uh, or, or you might see them at night or very often a lot of neighborhood women complained when they happened to be walking to the grocery store, a car would pull up and some guy would peel down the window and ask, are you walking or working? Uh, typical thing from the period. There was, you know, a lot of women were offended. They were being solicited, you know, that they were just, they were just happened to go to the store. So in November um, uh, 1981, 40 years ago, just a few months shy, uh, now a few months away from it, um, some of the barricades, if you drive around the West End today, you'll, you'll see some of the, the corners of, you can't do turns down some of them. And a lot of people thought they, these are just traffic calming measures, or in many cases, sometimes the, the street that's immediately in front of an apartment building is now like a little parklet, a little, there's some benches there and some trees, and it just looks, oh, this is part of the sort of neighborhood ambience. But they come from this area. They come from this era, pardon me, where the, the decision to, to put up barricades uh, was the idea. It almost, this was part of a campaign with, uh, called the Shame the Johns campaign that sort of came a couple of years later. Whereas the as the neighborhood goes to war with itself, this is Davy Street. Some of you might recognize the location because of the old uh, Sandman Rembrandt Hotel in the back. But it strikes me as a very sort of Orwellian uh, picture, you know, that was that was put together, uh, uh, paid for by the Shame to John's campaign, which was a group that was standing out on street corners next to some of the sex workers, taking down uh, license plate numbers, and then publicizing, putting up posters, blaming, you know, saying such and such car in the beginning, they just talked to what the car was and the license plate number came down, picked up a, and they were shining lights in cars, really trying to sort of harass uh, the, the drivers that were coming out as much and to a certain degree, as much as the sex workers who were ostensibly hey, trying to make a living, whether you agreed with it or not. Um, and that started some real, there was altercations, you know, and some real fear that would escalate. And it escalated even further. While the Shame the Johns were initially, they're remembered as kind of neighborhood harassment today and, and vigilantes that really uh, targeted sex workers unfairly. At the beginning, they were simply, it was really started as a campaign because of the, the, the concern over the underaged sex workers that were working. There were, there were uh, teenage sex workers from age 12, 13, 14, 15 that were, that were working uh, in the West End through, these, through this period. And there's been a lot of um, there's been a lot of sort of revisionist, dare I say that word, thinking about the, the West End. Um, in more recent years, um, a, a friend of mine, uh, Becky Ross, who's a sociology professor and feminist, a feminist professor at UBC, and Jamie Lee Hamilton, who was a, a you know a sex worker back in the day, a transgender sex worker, um, published a, a, a lot of uh, information in their views that uh, you know this was the golden age of sex work in Vancouver because the women didn't have pimps and uh, you know, they were working for themselves. They supported one another. They kept an eye out for one another. Well, that might be the case, but where I part company um, with, with them is, is that the, they really don't have an answer when it comes to the underage sex workers that were around, especially, you know, there were a lot of underage males um, that, that were working there. They don't really have an answer as to why, you know, why that should have been permitted as well. Um, there, there's uh, and whereas the transgendered, uh, sex workers did not have pimps, um, and many of the women didn't have pimps. There were pimps out there, um, and they were exploitative, and they were some of the nastier people that you've uh, you'll ever hear about, including including Wayne Harris, who is uh, significant in the book. So there's this whole attitude at the time. It's it's funny that, that you go down to the West End today, and you'll almost see no evidence of this today. You'll still see some of the old. Uh, traffic barriers and whatnot. And the one thing that stands is, which I, I didn't, unfortunately, my, my regret, I didn't include a picture of it. 
is the West End Sex Workers Memorial just off Jervis Street, uh, which is a lamppost made a red with a red light of the red light district, um, which I think is, is, is very just and, 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 and ably uh, recognizes um, a lot of the, you know, the, the sex workers that were there. It's, it was controversial when it came out. Some of the older residents that remember those years didn't like to see necessarily that uh, uh, memorialized that way. There was even people who suggested that it should be taken down. Um, there was an apology from the Vancouver Police Department um, that was offered that day. Excuse me, at the um, uh, when it was the inaugural uh, event for it and whatnot. I think it should be there. I think it's worthy, but um, it's interesting some of the debate that, that, that was around. It. But there, if, as I say, if you look back now, if you just moved to Vancouver or you've been in Vancouver, you know, many years, maybe you've been lived here the last 20 years or within BC and, you know, you would have no idea that this, uh, you know, this turbulent time existed in from the late 70s up until about 1984 uh, in the West End. And, and there's no hint of that today. If you live in the West, I talked to friends who, you know, live in there. I had no idea this happened. I had no idea this world was going on. But it was a real, uh, it was a real turbulent time, as I say, where it really pitted neighborhood attitudes and the neighborhood it's itself against one another because some of the a lot of the sex workers necessarily didn't live in that area but a lot of them did and um especially some of the males uh as well who often shared you know got a uh, you know two or three bedroom apartment and you know there'd be six of them living there you know sort of sharing rooms and things like that um so there's a real there was a, the, the people sort of forget uh, how as they say how turbulent that time was there was this was constantly news today and, and you know in 1981 I was 10 years old and I re even remember myself through those years on the news evening news every night there was film footage of some of the street corners um, that were around that uh, that were popular with sex workers and inevitably they the one shot they always like to show is of a, a girl in high heels and you just see the legs in the night with the the car lights going you know in the background and things like that that was constant vision as, as a 10 year old i remember asking my dad what are those girls doing dad and, and he's like well, i'll tell you when you're, when you're a little bit older but um but as i say it was a real this is not this is just in our sort of near history and it's kind of been forgotten it's interesting in popular culture some of the um um some of the films and television that we have now today that focuses on Times square in the 1970s and how uh police and public were dealing with the crime issues then of, of sex work on the street and whatnot. Um, uh, it, like there's an HBO show, show called The Deuce and there's another show, a little documentary called The Times Square Killer that talks about a serial killer. So, well, this is the same years that's, uh, that's, that's focused on. So uh, now it's totally inappropriate and reductive to compare uh, the Times Square uh, situation to Davy Street. But some of the same issues were still were the same problem, then, which is an interesting sort of thing to think about um, uh, back then. Um, some of the photos I managed to uh, get for the book are some really great, never before published photos. Uh, these ones, particularly of uh, around the time of the Shane the Johns campaign uh, that uh, brought a lot of people out from the neighborhood. Um, and these are photos that, as I say, not published before that I got from uh, Gordon Price uh, later to become a Vancouver uh, city councilor, but at the time was very active in uh, West End issues. A lot of people, some people blame him for uh, the, the shame that John's being campaign uh, campaign starting. He was an organizer in Crow, the concerned residents of the West End, who uh, uh, certainly spoke out about, didn't like the, the fact that the neighborhood had become this way. But I think sometimes the criticism is unfair or too much is leveled at him when you really start to, when you start to realize other issues that were going on um, that invited Mike Harcourt, the mayor, uh, and, and whatnot. And this, as I say, some great photos of, of, of the period of all this. Um, it wasn't just necessarily uh, the street sex work that was of the issue. Uh, all crime was going up. There was, if you look at the other crime statistics at the time, which are sort of forgotten, they were sort of forgotten at the time, interesting enough, or not recognized as the period, but um, there were more murders in the West End in 1982 than there were in the downtown east side. Now, that's a fascinating statistic, uh, you know, to think about um, uh, to, and to imagine that the neighborhood had got that way. In many ways, again, it wasn't as though that the streets of Davy Street was, was, you know, like the South Bronx or anything like that. Uh, you know, a lot of people, I have friends that grew up there and, and, and whatnot, and happily went along. Again, largely depending on where you lived, on one corner you were fine, where a block or two away, it was a different story because of this, the, the specific corners 
were being choked, were being used uh, for for sex work. And it's um, oh, we'll go back here. And it's interesting that um, uh, you know through that time, um, almost everything that that we did in Vancouver, all the way going back to you know the the barricades being put up, to well before that, to the um, to, you know in 1961 with that prostitution sting that happened. Every, every turn almost, it's interesting to look back now, we did the wrong thing. In the beginning, prostitution was largely happening in, a lot of times in hotel bars, there, you know, there were, there were sex workers working, hotel bars, nightclubs, like the penthouse. Even the Western Bayshore actually w- w- was selected, it was a popular place to police. Had to go in that. That's why you had some, some of these sort of house detectives, quote unquote, working in these hotels. Um, they, the decision was at a certain point, we got to flush them out of these hotels. It's bad for tourism. So what happens? They go into residences. They go into apartment buildings. Pretty soon, some of the neighbors would start to notice, geez, there's a lot of people coming in and out of that, you know, sweet 206. Uh, what's, I wonder what's going on there. And then they're flushed out of the, the apartment building. So then now they're pushed onto the streets. And then sex work is happening in the street. Now the neighborhood is upset that a Davy Street has prostitutes on it working. You see them at night, um, and and uh, there starts to be complaints to the police on that. So then they push them off Davy Street and onto the side streets. That's a worse problem because now people who are living in an apartment building see them working right outside their front door. And what happens then in 1984? Eventually, an injunction is uh, given uh, uh, to. Uh, basically push all sex workers out of the West End uh, to at least move west of Burrard. And that shuts it down overnight. I talked to one police officer who remembers the next day after that was done, he said, you could throw a bowling ball down David Davy Street and it wouldn't hit any car because the tra- it was amazing to him how much traffic. He always thought, oh, there's going to be probably less traffic because of the people cruising. But he said it was just dramatic to him he, to, that he was so surprised to see uh, such a change and Davy Street in the West End kind of quietened overnight because of that. The neighbors were overjoyed. But of course, the sex workers were simply just pushed into another area. And initially, they went up to Mount Pleasant, and the Mount Pleasant residents had to contend with that. And then they came back downtown and then moved into sort of the warehouse area of what is now Yale Town in many ways. Um, for those of you who lived here in the 1980s, you'll well remember on a Saturday night around that block of Seymour Street down to Richards. Uh, there were what seemed to me dozens and dozens of, of uh, female sex workers uh, around. Davis. Anytime I went to a movie downtown, I came back or sort of walking through an area, you'd see them and, and or driving around. You, it, it was it was like something like the Sunset Strip in, in, in Hollywood, you know, at its height. It was wild. Um, there wasn't anybody living down there then necessarily. There were a lot of sort of businesses that were closed at night. So ostensibly that became the city's red light zone until eventually some of the apartment buildings go up. And while, you know, you can maybe fight the police or, or neighborhood, you know, uh, initiatives to try and curb sex work, you can't beat a strata committee at the end of the day. And, the, you know, the, they really managed to clear the neighborhoods, um, you know, like that uh, out there. So it's an interesting, of course, there, there are people that, that really contest uh, that uh, the sex workers were simply pushed right down to Hastings Street. And I know um, Hamilton and Ross certainly, you know, Put that forward, and there and there are certainly instances where there would be some women who were working as long time working work as sex workers that were working in the West End that eventually, yeah, did find themselves um, down on Hastings Street. But it was much more secure. They didn't go directly there, and a lot of them, uh, a lot of the, the, the women that were part of uh, the missing women investigation and, and uh, victims of of uh, Picton were um, didn't have a necessary connection to that. But they do make the point, which is important that sex work was simply sort of pushed and swept off to whatever area we could do it. It would have ultimately solved this overnight that we wouldn't have had to deal with this in all these years. And somebody simply suggested, look, we need a red light district in town. But that in 1977 was far too progressive an idea for anybody to suggest reasonably in this city. Um, it would probably not go over well today with the way property values are. Nobody you know, wants to necessarily accept or imagine um, such a, you know, such a place being part of their, um, uh, you know, part of their neighborhood or live, having to live next door to that, you know, the, the nimbyism in Vancouver, who wants to invite? Yeah, sure. Use the parking lot next door, for, you know, 
There's that. I don't think that that evening that uh, suggestion would go over even less. In a way, the internet uh, kind of solved it all. First, actually, pagers uh, became the thing where you know uh, sex workers doing out calls could do that. They didn't have to be necessarily on the street anymore. Um, of course, these were the grand days of those newspaper ads in the back of the Georgia Strait or the Sun of the Province, even in many cases, when it was a thicker edition. Um, that you you know you that that sort of soliciting simply went. It went back indoors, and um, and eventually now the uh, as I say, the Vancouver doesn't even have a vice squad uh, today. It's called the counter exploitation unit, and they go specifically after um, pimps and, and whatnot, and child uh, sort of child predators, which is almost a it's what they do too, but it's almost a little bit slightly different category uh, and whatnot. Um, in the course of writing a book like this, you get lots of different material, and. Um, the book starts with a murder in Stanley Park, um, where a Trans Am uh, is found a little bit regularly parked, as you see it here, with a body found in the trunk of the car. And I talked to some of the investigators that were on that case. In fact, I'll read a little section of the book in just a moment for you. And in some of the work I've been doing, I've been hoping to find some photographs Interestingly, at the time, there was a, in, in May 1984, when this happened, there was a strike at the Pacific Press. So there wasn't any newspapers uh, that was publishing about that specific incident. The Globe and Mail actually wrote something, but nobody had any press photographers down there. Now, over the course of a couple of different books, I uh, managed to uh, make some good contacts within the retired Vancouver police community. And uh, I happened to speak to an investigator who says, Well, I've I've got some of my old notebooks. I've got a few old photos. Let me dig, see if I have anything. And he showed me this one, uh, which for those of you who ever done a freedom of information request with the police department, RCP, you know how difficult it is to get any crime scene pictures. Even a photo like this is, which is not graphic. There's not real violence. It doesn't look like there's any violence occurred here. Um, but because of quote unquote privacy issues, which they're constantly uh, doing. So I, I was hoping to get, you know, he showed me the he showed me the file that he had. It's interesting that he, he said, "Listen, Aaron, I've got I found a little book of notes uh, I made. I can come. Why don't I come meet you and, and I can show you? Uh, I can show you them." I said, "Boy, that would be great." And this was just at the beginning of the pandemic, and there was every, all the coffee shops were closed. We had nowhere to go to to meet, and uh, I live down in East Falls Creek, not far from the train station. He goes and he says, "Aaron, you're, let's let's go meet over by the." We'll go real spy stuff here. We'll meet over by the train station. I'll, I'll see you then, I thought. I didn't know if he was doing it for my benefit, but it felt so clandestine and so exciting. I had, you know, I, I think I put an overcoat on uh, and a trilby hat just, just for good measure. Just because I, I got so excited about this. But I was able to read quite a bit of his notes from the, from the homicide file, which I later did file an FOI request on. And of course, there's a, there's a full folder, a legal size folder of what that is. I was given maybe three pages of it. And I wasn't given this photo and I was troubled by that. So I appealed to the Vancouver uh, VPD uh, privacy and information office. And I said, look, I know there are photos of the crime scene. I know they're not graphic and I want to appeal this decision that I haven't been given. And she said, well, how do you know that? And I showed her this photo. She's and, uh, to Sarah, I'll, Sarah Weatherspoon. I'm happy to, she's a friend and she's been very helpful, but I'll mention who she was. And she's always been helpful for my stuff. And I said, look, and she said, Where the, how the hell did you get that? How are you ending up with, with pictures of, you know, this is private stuff. This is, uh, you know, this is uh, kept information within the police department, even if a, even as of a crime that is sought, had, was later solved um, from 1984. And I said, look, I know it's there. I've, I've, I've met with an officer who his partner collected some of this stuff. He's passed on. His family gave it to him to hold on to. And that's what I've seen. So I haven't. I know generally what's there, but I don't know the whole thing. So I did appeal uh, the decision. They did give me this photo and I think this other one here, but they blocked out the uh, license plate number and uh, and they blocked out the blankets that you see in the, which I, which I, which I thought was a bit silly, but uh, I wanted to show them to you because sometimes just to, by way of an example, uh, this is the, uh, this is sometimes the thing one must contend with. Um, but I went down, I, I found that spot um, at Stanley Park on the other side of Lost Lagoon there. And the book um, opens up with uh, a chapter called Murder of Lost Lagoon, which I'll, if I can, I'll just read a, not the whole chapter. 
bit too short, but uh, just a, maybe a brief excerpt towards the end to give you a little taste of the, uh, of the book. Excuse me. So, and we'll get ready for some questions in just a minute here. Um, here we go. Contemporary homicide investigations are markedly different from those in the 1980s. The same homicide had occurred today, it probably would have led to the mobilization of an additional 20 police officers to cordon off an area and perform a ground search to comb for evidence 40 to 50 feet back into the bush of Stanley Park. Today, forensic computer connect technicians with 3D scanning technology are also regularly deployed to, crime, to a crime scene to create simulations and maps. And the investigations results in enough boxes of reports, notes, photographs, interview transcripts and documents to fill an entire storage room. But in 1984, aside from in the immediate area, uh, immediate search of the area, a few photographs of the car and the surrounding scene, some notes and diagrams, and a handful of interview transcripts, a 1980s homicide often didn't fill much more than a large legal size folder. In this particular situation, perhaps a greater search of the area wasn't, simply wasn't considered necessary. Most of the immediate crime scenes speak, seem to speak for itself. It was certainly clear that the cause of death was not accidental because of the blunt force trauma the victim had sustained and because they'd been shoved into the trunk of a car. For the lack of blood around the scene of the vehicle compared to what was isolated in the trunk, police suspected this spot was not the original location of the murder. Doctors from, VP, from the VPD pathology department at the scene officially pronounced the victim dead and determined that the death appeared not to have occurred in recent hours, but likely a day or two previous. The telltale odor of a body uh, uh, but dead for a while and stored in an enclosed space in warm weather was certainly not unfamiliar to the veteran police officers present. One didn't need a university accredited forensic science background to recognize that smell. Joggers and people around their evening stroll around Stanley Park began to stop along police tape to get a closer look. Some of the officers recognized the victim of the trunk. Casual speculation had begun among them that this person was quote unquote known to police. At this point, one officer uh, one, one more officer uh, arrived, walked up to the, uh, pardon me, walked up to the rear of the vehicle and saw unveiled from behind some bloody blankets, the body of the victim. And that's when the rain that had been forecast for that day began to fall. Staff Sergeant Rich Rollins from the major crime section had marked his 17th anniversary with the Vancouver Police Department the day before. He would become the senior officer of this investigation. I spent a lot of years on homicide investigations and I saw a lot of autopsies as Ron's recalling that day in May, almost 40 years later. This ended up being one of the most interesting cases I've ever worked. And just when I thought it couldn't get any more bizarre, it did. So a little teaser there from uh, Vancouver Vice. This street, uh, in Nicola um, uh, was a corner of where um, a lot of the male sex workers were using and is also the cover of the book. Um, I invite you to read the book. I do hope you'll enjoy it. It is a uh, it's a remarkable story of uh, of what happens in the uh, in the West End in those years and uh, let me stop the share there and I think uh, I think you'll find it interesting not only as a look back on a certain period of uh, city history at the time but also a look back on how the city's changed that uh, it's difficult to imagine the circumstances of what set up things in those years could actually ever happen again necessarily. It's interesting that we're talking so much about, um, I think that some of this conversation is happening in Victoria, but certainly in Vancouver and, and, and not so much maybe in some of the smaller towns and, the, and cities in the, in, the, in the province, but certainly in, the, in, our, in our bigger cities about stranger violence and, and rising crime rates downtown and, and, our, and whatnot and what we can do about it and, and how bad it's, it's gotten and it never used to be like this. Well, it, it did used to be like this. In fact, it used to be worse. A lot of debates I get into with people are, uh, you know, people say, oh, Vancouver was so much better back in the day, better, you know, much better back then. It's terrible now. Well, I, I would disagree. This is one era of, of Vancouver that we might be quite happy to say is in, the, is in our past. Um, because largely, again, depending on who you were and where you lived, you know, that you might not be as, as fortunate um, as that. And the book gets into those details and gets the story, and it's a little bit of a murder mystery. It's a little bit of a cultural history, uh, but I do hope you'll enjoy it if you get a chance to read it. Thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, and that was great. That was really interesting, and the photos and your sources are always an interest. 
So thank you very much. And I would like to remind all of you that just before Q&A, we'll start that in a second, that of course our next event will be on March 20th. And now I will hand it over to Jesse to start our Q&A. Thanks, Megan, and thanks to Aaron for that really engaging and, and, and visual presentation. I think it's um, watching all the photos that you've come across and newspaper clippings, you know, it makes me want to go into the archives and do more research of my own. Um, and thanks also for, for those notes about the, the friends of the, um, the City of Vancouver archives and the good work that you're doing over there. So I posted a link to, to the friends of the Vancouver archives in the, in the chat and I encourage people to take a look. Um, so we have time for, for questions from any of you who have questions for Aaron about um, his research he's talked about here or some of his earlier research unit, even if you wish. So I invite you to at this time to um, just pop your questions into the chat and I'll read them out to Aaron. Um, but I thought I'd start Aaron um, just to get the ball rolling with something that you mentioned as we were setting up, which was, um, yeah, this, the history that you've, um, that you've been engaged with recently has been more 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 recent than some people are used to thinking when they think of history this is these are not all black and white photos and this is, sure. is not carriages and trolleys so i just th thought i'd ask you about your experience of writing history that you know some of which you were alive during during and and saw aspects of firsthand at a distance but what, what that experience is like for you as a, as a researcher delving into more recent history it's a, it's a great question actually because it, it it i realized that some of my formative uh, decisions to get involved in Vancouver history, which I've probably been doing for about 20 years now. Um, I didn't, didn't necessarily have an interest in this as a teenager. I didn't, I walked around my city not thinking that there was really anything worth uh, my interest uh, and whatnot. And I, for many years, I was a, a touring musician and I would take off on tour and come back four or five months later and realize, hey, that bookstore is now a pizza place or this, it's never the other way around. The pizza place never turns into a bookstore. It's always the other way around. But I would notice the changes in the city. And of course, Vancouver was changing a lot. And everybody talks about 1986. Everything changed after 1986. That's not really true. The, the momentum of that change really didn't start to present itself until I would say the mid 90s and later, um, where especially downtown. And I began to realize as somebody who's born and raised in Vancouver, I just turned 50 uh, last July dare I say, my age, uh, but I, I, I began to think to myself, I remember Falls Creek when there were log booms down there. I remember Arbutus when the brewery was out there and you'd walk through it in the morning and it would stick a hops. You know, I remember how the smells of Vancouver changed. I remember how the city changed and not just in terms of new businesses living there or, or, or new business being there or pe new, you know, people moving downtown to live. That was unheard of in the 70s and 80s, you know, the very few, unless you're in the West End, of course, but uh, in the areas that we have now in Yale Town and even along Granville and whatnot, you know, so, um, so I began to sort of appreciate around, and it was around 2000, 2001, I started going on some Vancouver history tours just around my neighborhood. And I began to sort of the, the, the penny dropped, you know, that I, I thought, geez, I, rem I remember a lot of this stuff. And I remember, so I'm in many ways, I'm, I, I, I joked around, I think earlier before we our, our or talk that I, I or maybe just after I began I some of this is a, is, is in creating a personal time machine for myself so where I can go back to play you know the, the certain years where I was too young to go to some of these places or what but I was aware I remember the news stories I remember the what was going on I remember hearing my parents talk about it my relatives and whatnot um, so you know the, the period of more recent history it's and there's been a real interesting thing interesting thing that's happened in Vancouver in the last I'd say 15 years, where there's been a whole wave of new work and new writing on Vancouver history that's happened. It's been a real renaissance period, I think, in terms of Vancouver history writing. And it's been exciting to, dare I say, be a part of it. Um, of course, there were, there were these real sort of titans like Chuck Davis in Vancouver that was writing sort of popular history and whatnot. And, uh, and, and John Atkin, who's another pillar, who's still there, you know, doing it. But there was a wave of new books and uh, coming out. Uh, you know, Belshawn Purvey's Vancouver Noir. I always sort of I joke around with him saying that was like the Ramones to me. You you, you saw that and then you, you you wanted to do it yourself. You know, like uh, like that. So I, you know, I had been I had been writing for the Vancouver Courier when that was around in the early two thousands, and uh, within about ten years of that, I write my first book necessarily but there was as i said there's been a whole wave of new stories and new and i'm excited for what's coming next you know i i, I think there's 
there's some great topics out there that no one's touched on yet. And it's more, more recent here. Some of our immigrant history is real fascinating. And there's, there's a book lying in wait about Vancouver's Indo-Canadian community and how that's, how that is assimilated into the city and, and you know, from the 1950s onward, I think. Um, so there's so many exciting subjects out there that people tell me, are you going to write something that's not Vancouver related? And I say, well, I'll get to it eventually, but there's so much exciting stuff there right now that's out there. And that if you just do a little bit of digging, um, you'll find something. Or if you, if you've got, if you, there's some place in town that you walk by and you think, geez, I remember what used to be there. Um, and I remember the old guy on that corner, you know, you start dig into that. You know, the archives and, and, and our newspaper archives as well, as well, but but what you find in the city archives is so amazing that you can just go down to your archives building, just open a drawer and just pick one thing out. You'll find something and you'll go down a rabbit hole and you'll be there all day that they're going to have to tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, we got to close. got to go home. Uh, but uh, there's just so much exciting stuff out there to, to, to find. And there's been it's been exciting to to see the wave of new material and new writing that's, that's uh, out there about city histories uh, and whatnot. Um, and another thing I'm really curious about as well is, well, that you, you mentioned at the beginning sort of the context for some of this history that you've explored was this, this development boom happening in, in the West End and that there is a, uh, a tension between, you know, the, the condos going up or at least the high rises going up and, and the, the detached residence buildings. And I think a lot of us certainly here in Victoria, where I'm speaking from, but elsewhere in the province um are, are seeing that happen you know today in different ways so I, I wonder like as you're as you're writing about this history where this is the backdrop to the history you're writing how how are you um you know reading the headlines about the ways our, our, our cities are changing today in this province oh sure yeah and, and and just this week when we've heard that you know uh thanks to the new census information coming out that we hear that you know british columbia is only increasing in population and not just in our cities and our suburbs but to the you know the the one might say the secondary cities, you know, like Kelowna, a great example, you know, where you've got lots of people moving to the interior and whatnot. So, you know, Vancouver and British Columbia and Victoria, some of the surrounding cities into the interior, up north, up the seashell coast, there, there, people are coming here. There, there, this is God's country. They're realizing this is a place to be in Canada, you know, like some of the uh, some of my friends are in Ontario or are like geez I'm thinking of, I gotta get out there I, I'm sick of the cold <laughs> here so it's it's interesting to see um, you know there's more and more coming people here and there's more and more of course influence of the Pacific Rim uh, to be had and I said within the, within the, the, the stories there's there's been so many new um, Canadians that have moved to uh, British Columbia you know they, the, you know I, somebody mentioned to me the other day is that you, it sounds it seems like a lot of your stuff is for people that are born and raised here. And I say, that's a, that's a big audience, but there's a huge audience of people out there who want to find out what was there before them, not just in the last 10, 15 years. They were curious about, you know, some of the indigenous stories uh, that haven't properly been given a spotlight. You know, with, with, even with a book like The Last Gang in Town, which is a, a, a gang crime story, I have friends that live up in that area, Clark Park, that went and bought the book, said, I just wanted to find out what happened, what this neighborhood was all about, years ago, you know, and, and so there's, there's a real, there's a real appetite out there, which is, I think, interesting. And some, you know, it's a great time to be involved in British Columbia history and Vancouver history, city history, municipal, be a, being a civic historian for those people out there, or amateur historians, <clears throat> whether you have any academic uh, background or not, <clears throat> because there's just a, just a great wave of material and a lot of individuals who have, you know, have some longstanding family connections to, to in BC or immigrants that, important stories that are coming out in articles and books and it's uh, i think it's only getting more exciting and more uh more interesting yeah well said it's a good time to be both a, a researcher and also a reader of, of history in, in bc that's it. that's it um i've received one question uh, through a direct message um asking about whether you have another book project in the works and if you could perhaps share some details geez i just finished this one how how quickly you want me to get back to work no it's i i uh, i cannot tell a lie i've actually uh I'm actually uh, involved in three uh, different books now. I, I uh, <clears throat> you know, I have some author friends who've written like and George Bowring, you know, has written like 30, 40 books. I don't know what damn books that guy has. <laughs> and I joked around with them at a dinner uh, saying, I don't know, geez, I, I, you know, I guess I started maybe a little later. I didn't start as early as he did, but I got, I got to make up some ground here and, and catch up. To it. But uh, you know, it's, it's, it's quality, not quantity, of course, or like that. But um, I, um, 
typically these books take a couple of years worth of research and then another year to write. Um, you know, I, I've, I've, I've done five books in nine years um, and some of them have overlapped the work. So, but and, and it feels like yeah, I, I, a buddy of mine said, you know, there's university professors who don't put out that kind of output uh, or publishing output. You should be really happy with, with it. And I am, but there's, there's, a, there's stuff that I'd like to get to. And I, and um, I realize if I step on the gas a little bit, um, some of that research will, um, uh, will get going. And the, the research is often the, the tougher part because uh, just getting those stories, making those connections, finding those photographs, finding out who has, if there's something that's not in the archives, finding out who might have it. And then in turn convincing that person, you should donate that to the archives when you're done, you know, and, and, uh, and whatnot. So I'm, uh, I, I'm working right now, I'm working on sort of three different projects. One of them I can say about, um, which is a, uh, a book that delves into um, the history of Vancouver restaurants and the very food that we've eaten and examining how the lens, you know, again, through the lens of the kind of food we've eaten, the restaurants we've gone to, how that's changed, how the city's changed. Uh, and whatnot. It's, it, I find it interesting that, you know, you look back at the 1940s and 50s and it's sort of diner food. There were, you know, we have, we have such a choice of uh, different kind of food today that we eat. And, and our palate is widened too, you know, that, uh, that I've just started, a, uh, I invite everybody to join uh, a Facebook group called Vancouver Restaurant History. And that's quite frankly, and I think I've still told people, that's kind of a fishing line for me to connect with not only some chefs and waiters and restaurant managers but people who ate in some restaurants that are long gone now in the city who people might remember their favorite place um to start getting some stories and, and information maybe even a few recipes um and whatnot that uh, start to, to collect so sometimes the collection or how do you put the feelers out there and get the word out there is is half the battle um with the bank with the commodore ballroom book just to tell a short anecdote um my friend squire barnes over at Global BC and television station wanted to do a little feature on the history of the Commodore Ballroom. And we went down there, we filmed a little bit, we had some posters we were showing and stuff like that. And at the end of it, he happened to say, uh, Aaron's working on a book. If you got any good stories, you know, contact. I don't think he even gave a contact, but uh, the next day the station was flooded with calls and emails, which got forwarded to me. And I, and, or they, I said, let's just go ahead and give him my number. And it's funny because a woman called and said, my mother was a nightclub photographer in the 1940s. And she's got a, some great photos of the Commodore in 1946. Um, and uh, what you do is there, she would come around each table and you'd get a picture. We had selfies back then. We just paid somebody to do it. That's the, that's the thing I found interesting. Uh, and uh, and you get, get a photo of you and your friends at your table, you know, at the, at the end of the night. And I said, gosh, I'd love to see some of them. And she says, oh, yeah, I've got a bunch of them. And I've got one of the, the coat check girls. There at 19. I said, wow, that's great. Okay, let's meet next week. Let's, I'll, we'll, we'll talk again. Here. About 15 minutes later, I get a call from an elderly woman in West Vancouver who says that she was a coat check girl at the Commodore Ballroom in 1946. And I said, I think we should meet uh, later this week. I've got an appointment with somebody else. but, but And uh, of course, I met the woman whose mother had been the photographer and I got some scans of those pictures. And I said, this is great because I think I know, I think I have a good feeling about this one. And when I met this uh, this uh, elderly woman, Dorian Christie is her name, was her name. Uh, I she talked about her, you know, the working at the Commodore, and she was young then. I think she was only seventeen, um, and uh, remembered the managers and the security guys and the the kitchen staff and whatnot. And I said, "Do you know anything about this picture here?" And I showed her a picture of her two coworkers that she had never seen before, and she hadn't seen it since 1946. And geez, it almost made a spider crawl in my throat. Her emotional reaction. Because she immediately said, oh, my God, I haven't, this is, you know, it's about, imagine being shown a picture of yourself that you never knew was taken uh, or forgotten that was ever a part of something being shown 50 years later, you know, like um, 50, 60 years later. So it, was, it really, it, that was great. Um, so it, it, sometimes, you know, the, the, the job for somebody like me doesn't start simply at the archives. It's always the first stop, and, and, you know, uh, of any place but you know but you've got to then go out and do some of the detective work to get those stories you wouldn't otherwise get and uh, in turn some of this stuff does end up you know at the archives because then some of the owners of some material people have posters flyers menus uh from over the years who are getting on suddenly think you know what my kids aren't interested in this stuff would anybody in the archives would and i said yeah i've got a number talk to this person you know so it's i, I hope they kind of feed one another cross pollinate one another in, in that sense too
Yeah, I think that's a great point. I love the idea of using Facebook as a, as a research tool. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's super creative. And also, and people who are attending won't know this, but when we, the friends of the BC Archives, initially approached Aaron about giving a talk, it was about Vancouver After Dark. And he said to us, well, I actually have a new book out since then. So can I, can I talk about that instead? So, you know, you, you have some time to catch up to George Bowering, but I think you're on your way. <laughs> Oh, he's way ahead of me. Yeah, I grew, it's interesting. I, I I was I grew up next to George, George Barron, Canadian poet, Canadian author, very well known. He's my next door neighbor, and Thea, his daughter, was a childhood friend of mine. And my people say, "Well, how'd you get into writing?" And I said, "Well, you know, my, my my mother was a writer a little bit. My dad was a book guy too. But uh, my my bedroom window used to look out onto George Barron's work, and I used to see him typing like this, basically. So when I had an, an idea." Of, of if you're going to write a book, I, I kind of had an idea what it was. It was there's a great Mark Twain quote that to write a book, it's the application of the seat of the pants to the seat of the chair, and you simply have to sit there and do it, and and it requires a lot of daily, you know, into the night, into the morning writing, as if you're me. But um, uh, I had an, I, I, I think in a way the seed was dropped, you know, like I, I, it's it's I'm being maybe the overly prophetic and and about it uh, about that significance of that event. But I told him that and he sort of laughed at me, but. Uh, I think I had an idea of what, you know, that you, 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 there's a lot of hard work and, and this does take time, you know, like I, that's the one thing I wish as a musician, I would play every night. And if the show wasn't that good, we could try it again the next night. We'd work out the kinks. Oh, that's a better, with a book, you can spend, you know, a couple of years working on this and you think at the end of it, God, I hope this is any good. I hope this is not a piece of crap. I hope people will find this as interesting as I'm interested in it. And usually it's been a good litmus test that, that if I like it, or I'm fascinated by, by it. Somebody else out there will too, or somebody doesn't know they're going to be as interested in, in it when they until they read, you know, what's happened. So it's uh, it's been good. Uh, it, it's been fun to do, uh, and, and it's been really rewarding. And, and and people have been very kind. And, and you know, uh, myself, people like myself, and, and Jason Vanderhill, and uh, Tom Carter, Bill Allman, we're all sort of I like to think little disciples of uh, uh, Chuck Davis the late great Chuck Davis, who wrote so many Vancouver history books when no one else was really doing this. And we are now going out as to the flock and spreading, uh, spreading the gospel around the, around the province and the country saying how fascinating this stuff is and how, you know, our stories are, are just as interesting as, you know, we, we tend to sort of focus on New York or Los Angeles or, or London, you know, these, the big cities of the world to where our reference points are, where, you know, and where the, the most popular stories are set. But, I find there's Vancouver has so much fascinating stuff that's just as fascinating to me uh, as anything that's happening worldwide, and sometimes even more because our city is so young, or many cities are young in, in British Columbia compared to back east and whatnot, and, or over in Europe, that the history of Vancouver has happened before our very eyes. So we're living it, we're watching it as it's been happening, and that's a unique situation to be in. That's different than if you're writing about Boston in the 1800s, or or you're writing about you know New York City in, in its early years, or, or or London, you know, in the 1500s. It's a totally different thing. It's 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 even more. You're right in the movie. You're right. You're you're not just watching it, but you're living it. So it's uh, and you hope that you got it right because I try and write these things thinking 20 years now somebody might be reading this. I'd hate to have this be dated, or hate to be. A little out of tune you know what you, you want to write these things that are uh, any any history you want to do has or you, you write on needs to be uh have the right tone and not sort of caught too much in the amber of the time that it's written you know that uh and as i so as i say you know that the, the the city the city history sort of unfolding before our very eyes that way that's what makes it particularly exciting here in bc we have another question we're getting close to 3 30 here but we have one more question yeah. um uh, somebody noting um, the resonance between um, the, the themes that you're examining, also uh, Eve, La Eve Lazarus's work uh, looking yes. at crime and in Vancouver, um, and and she was wondering if you've ever collaborated or or how if your your work has ever connected between you and Eve Lazarus. We we have Eve's a, Eve's a great friend and and uh, we talk all the time. Um, and uh, we've certainly given each other shout outs for books. I think I've given her a couple of book blurbs, book blurbs, pardon me, on the back. Uh, I, think, I think she owes me one now I, I, at this point. I've given her a couple. But no, he's, he's a great pal. And, and I'm, I'm so impressed um, with some of the stuff that she's done, and particularly the, you know, the, the, the Babes in the Woods case that she has devoted a lot of writing to that has just amazingly in this last month been solved thanks to technology thanks a lot to of course a lot of uh, vpd forensic people who uh, devoted the time to it but he kind of was writing about it when this was a 
dare I say, a dead story or a story that had been told so much. But she introduced it to a whole new group of people who I think took interest in it. <clears throat> and I think putting that focus on it certainly helped. Um, and now we have the solution uh, to that case, not just from me's writing, of course, but and, and the great work done by some VPD people like Brian Honeyborn, who took those skulls from the, uh, you know, the Babes in the Woods case, made sure that they were, you know, that they could have some DNA taken from them, <clears throat> this kind of thing. So uh, even I have talked about, uh, even I talked about, I've, I've, he does a podcast and I've been a guest on a podcast because <clears throat> some, an interesting, um, some interesting unsolved crimes that are mentioned in Vancouver After Dark uh, came up sort of at a crossroads with her, some of her writing. So you can seek that out um, uh, on, on her, uh, on her podcast. But uh, um, we, I, I don't think we've decided to, co-author anything specifically together or whatnot. she's up in north van and i'm down at false creek so we don't we, we, maybe now that the pandemic so we'll see each other more maybe a, a an idea will we'll drop it's not another question uh, uh but uh but uh yeah no but she's great she has amazing stuff that she's working on all the time uh too so yeah well with um the history of vancouver and of of, of crime and spectacle well covered and, and and growing we'll leave it at that Aaron. Sure. so thank you so much for for joining us and, and sharing your research sharing these amazing photographs and i encourage um everybody here to go um look at your work i think it's published with arsenal um press is the yes the uh, all, all, all five of my books have thankfully the guys at uh, arsenal and uh have published um, there's another book called vancouver confidential that was put out by anvil press it's a compilation a book of uh, a number of us some of the people I mentioned today who were involved in Vancouver history writing, uh, put that out. That's worth seeking out too. And uh, but check Arsenal Press if you're looking up for any more of my stuff. And uh, and I'll have some talks going forward um, with the Vancouver Historical Society and the Vancouver Police Museum uh, right. coming up in April and May if you're in town. So that's great. So look look out for those. And and um, I've just posted into the chat a link to your your um, author page from Arsenal um, Pulp, and great. then also a link to the Friends of the BC Archives. Um, we have another event coming up in, in March, um, and of course, I encourage all of you to get involved with your local archives and with, with the BC Archives. Um, so with that, thank you again, Aaron, for your time and for sharing your, your research, and thank all of you for attending um, and making time in your day to, to hear about this uh, fascinating history. So thanks, thanks very much. All. And folks, if you had a question you didn't get to ask or you want to you think of it after we've closed off here, you can find me uh, just at email me, or you can find me on Twitter and Facebook, Aaron Chapman. A-R-O-N-C-H-A-P-M-A-N. And my email is Aaron at AaronChapman.net. If you have a question or a good idea for a book that I haven't thought of, hey, I want to hear from you. You might, we might, let's make some money together and, and, uh, and make a, a book that everyone wants to, to read. <laughs> okay, thanks, Aaron. And goodbye, everybody. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thanks for coming. Have a great week.